Thank you for joining us again tonight on Feed Your Faith. Last night, we looked at the examination of, is there a God? Is it reasonable to conclude that there is a God who is behind this world? We noted the fact that if we thought that everything just fell into place by chance, that it just happened to get this way, the vastness and the intricacy, the power, the order and design of this universe suggest clearly that there is a designer, that there's someone behind with sufficient power and wisdom to bring all that we see. Surely it's beyond the capability of any man. So we are looking for someone that is greater than man who brought all these things to exist. If they were eternal themselves and did not come from anything, they just are forever here, then the power in this universe would have already run down. But the very fact is that it is impossible for us to have this level of intricacy and power and grandeur that's on display with the wisdom of everything that is behind it, how it all fits together without understanding there is one of almighty power and of unlimited knowledge and wisdom. And that's God, God who is omnipotent and omniscient we must conclude when we look at this world is behind it all. Romans chapter 1 had the Apostle Paul pointing that out, that the things that are made show his everlasting power and divinity. And so tonight, what we want to look at is what we closed with last night. If there is a God and he is the one who made this world, he is the power behind it all, and everything has a purpose. What is my purpose in life? Well, I have to find that somewhere. So it's obvious that that God giving us the ability to reason and to find him has made himself known. And that is where we have it in his creation. I am the one who am subject to him. But before we talk about the idea of being subject to him and what we find from that word of God, I want to go back, if I might, and just notice something with you about the idea of his word as declaring the nature of who God is and what he has done. We noted last night the fact that from the Bible, we recognize that there is a message. The Bible points out the fact that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But why does it come from that? Well, the clarity is that the Bible is that which is the giving of a notice of who God is and what he wants us to do. When Paul talks about the scripture as he speaks to Timothy, he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped, for every good work. The biblical claim then is that God is the true author behind the word. Did he use men to speak his will? Yes. Did he use different men who had different vocabulary and declare that in different ways? Yes. He chose the right man for the right time to speak exactly what he wanted them to speak. But make no mistake about it. The claim of the Bible is very clear. God is the one who inspired it. And he inspired it to tell man everything that he needs to know about how to find God and about how to act in this world. He makes the man of God complete, thoroughly equipped to every good work. It is our sufficient guide to find out what God's will is and what our responsibility is in this world. Having noticed that, I want to return with you back to the Old Testament for just a little bit and notice the kind of a, a context that exists in the latter part of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah is divided up into two parts. The first 39 chapters basically dealing with the fact that Israel and Judah had gone away from God. Israel was just about to be overcome and taken into Assyrian captivity. Assyria tried to come against Judah, but Hezekiah at that time was a good king, and for the sake of the good king Hezekiah, God spared Judah for a time, but pointed out that Babylon was coming and would overcome Judah later on down the line, some 120 years after that. 
But what do we see in that second part of Isaiah as it begins? Chapters 40 through 45 began a theme which really is all through that latter part. But the point is, if you believe in these gods, these idols that they were serving, he said, let them bring their case, or you bring the case for them. Why should they be considered gods? And God says, I'm going to present my case. And the case that he presents is that he is one who shows his knowledge, his wisdom, by pointing out things that had happened past. Some of the Bible writers were ones who talked about things that happened long before their existence. For instance, Moses, talking about the things that had happened in Genesis and Exodus. He was not one who had lived since the beginning of the world, but he was one who made known these things and accurately pointed them out. And then the other case is, God says, is I'm going to tell you things to come. In other words, I'm going to make predictive prophecy and I'll tell you what is going to happen in the future. No man can do that. That's beyond his ability. And not only that, but God made it clear that if one thing falls to the ground, if one of those predictions is false, then the one who speaks is not a prophet of God. Well, what do we find in the scripture? We find hundreds of events foretold hundreds of years but always with 100% accurately, not a thing false. You have cases in Isaiah of him talking about Babylon and how it would fall at the height of his power. And in Daniel, you see how that came about. You see the fact of it being pointed out as something that would take place where the city would be de desolate, left without inhabitation from that point on. And to this very year, 2020, Babylon still has not been that which has been rebuilt and dwelt in. It is uninhabited. A man by the name of Saddam Hussein said he was going to renovate Babylon and he was going to be one who reigned from that city and that would show the Bible was false. But you know, Saddam didn't make it for that. God is still true. Saddam did not have his way. When you look at Tyre, you look at a nation of Phoenicia, which was there along the Mediterranean coast. As people came against them to overcome that mainland city of Tyre, they'd go out to an island about a mile away and they would escape for a little while. At least most of them would. But when Alexander the Great came, he not only was ready to take that mainland city of what was left of it, but he scraped the dirt, scraped the rock to like it was a bare surface put all of those buildings, everything else into the sea and built a causeway out there to that island and destroyed it as well. To this day, Tyre has never been rebuilt. And that's what the word of God says. How is it that he knew about these kind of things so far in advance? If you were trying to make a case, you can't make a better case than God did about the two opposite sides the historical accuracy, but also the 100% accuracy on the fact of what would happen in the future. If you try to move the prophet forward to where you can explain the predictive prophecy, then how did he know all about that time which he said he was writing? But if the skeptics and atheists would have their way, that's no, no, no. He wrote that many hundreds of years later. He just acted like he wrote before. How do I explain the historical accuracy then? But if I leave that prophet where he was and explain the historical accuracy, then how do I deal with the predictive prophecy? Because that is also something that needs to be looked and taken into account. So with the prophecies of the nations, you find out that the, God, uh, that the Old Testament abounds with cases of what would happen to Tyre and Sidon, what would happen to Babylon, what would happen to Assyria and Nineveh, its capital. And all of these cases are true, even down to amazing kind of a details. But then there's also the problem of how do I explain in the Old Testament the 332 Messianic prophecies? Every one of them are fulfilled. 
and exactly as they are given in Scripture. And how did that happen? You see, the fact is that the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek. It's called the Septuagint version under uh, the order of Alexander the Great. Finished somewhere at about 250 to a little bit uh, earlier than 200 B.C. So I know for sure that every one of those books existed in the Old Testament at least 200 years before Christ came along. So how was it that 332 predictions are made and 332 come to be true? A guy by the name of Peter Stoner gave the probability of that happening just with eight prophecies coming true in the same man at being one in about 100 quadrillion. He also pointed out that if you took 48 of those, that was a number that was fantastic, 10 to one, the 157th power. That's one with 157 zeros behind it. That's impossible. That's the kind of odds that no one would bet on. Unless you're going to bet against God being the order behind this universe and the order behind the scripture, you dare not suggest it comes from anybody other than God. The fact is, that can't happen by dumb luck. And he said those idols are unable to produce a case like I am, and no other person has either. The God of the Bible puts himself apart singularly to be the one who is the true author of Scripture. And when you look at that, some people will say, well, maybe so, but we're just not real sure that we have the original of what was given in the Bible. Let me suggest something to you. When you look at authors of ancient works, whether it be Herodotus or Plato, or you're talking about any of these other men, Homer, back in the ancient Greek times, in 800 B.C., wrote the Iliad. We all accept that. But it was written in 800 B.C. We don't have the first copy until about 400 B.C., 400 years later. And of all the copies we have, that's the most from antiquities of 643. But the fact is, if you come to the New Testament, you're looking at over 24,970 pieces of evidence to show us the text of the New Testament, the Old Testament, many, many that were there, along with an interesting case. What happened with the Old Testament is we took it back 600 years from the oldest known manuscripts of the Old Testament to what was discovered in what are called the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know how many major differences there are from that 1,000-year period about to where you had that text taken back that far? None. Not a single significant case. What does that tell me? The Bible was accurately preserved. It was accurately preserved by the hand of God's providence as men copied it and were careful and presented all of those cases. But even if I didn't have the manuscript, I have what's called those who were patristic writers. And they were very close to the time of the New Testament. And what do you have of them? A grand total of 36,289 quotes of that New Testament scripture. And when you take that many cases of evidence, compile it with the others that were on top of that of the manuscripts, you have the best attested to manuscripts that are in the world. If you believe Shakespeare wrote the various things, Macbeth or Romeo and Juliet and various of those, you don't have nearly as many copies from early on near Shakespeare as you do in the New Testament. If you think Caesar wrote the Gallic Wars, any of us who went through Latin had to usually remember, have a, a kind of a... Uh, putting of that into our memory and reciting the introduction to the Gallic Wars. But I don't have the evidence that he was the writer of the Gallic Wars like I do that you have the writers of the New Testament being true and what they said actually having evidence. So what do we find from all of that? 
the Bible stands alone. And as the Bible that stands alone, it stands alone in a way that you can have faith that God has made it possible for us to know his will. 1 Peter chapter 1 ends with that very point when it talks about the gospel that brings this salvation to mankind is the same gospel that was preached to you. That gospel that was preached in the first generation is the gospel that you and I have, not a changed or altered form, but you and I have what was written by the inspiration of God. What do we need to do? We need to search after that God. We know that he's there by the evidence. We look at the word and we see enough to tell us that's God's word. So what's our next step? That's what we'll talk about tomorrow evening, the Lord willing. Hope you'll join us then and thank you for being with us. Good night.